Our scripture this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew as we continue our sermon series on the parables. And this is often called the parable of the sheep and the goats. Hear now God's word to each of us. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it? that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, You did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You know, over the years, I have um, caught a couple uh, episodes of that show, Undercover Boss. Have you ever seen one of those episodes before? Yeah, so so the premise is is that the the CEO or one of the really high-level executives They go undercover, sometimes put a little disguise on, and they get hired in some of the kind of, you know, ground-level employees. And nobody knows who they are. They're simply treated as a, a new employee, and they're there to kind of really find out what their company is like in a, a day-to-day operation. So they're immersed in the life of their company. They get to know who some of their employees are. Um, who they are, what they're like, what they think, how well they do their job, and how they treat people. And my favorite part of the whole show is when um, this, you know, new employee reveals that they are actually the CEO of this multi-million dollar company. Uh, And much to the shock, surprise, and sometimes horror of the co-workers who are there, because they had no idea and they have not exactly treated this new employee who oftentimes cannot always do the kind of manual work of those day-to-day operations very well. But it's an opportunity for the CEO or whoever to really find out um, who is representing the company, how well they're doing their job, and again, how they treat people. This parable could be called the parable of the undercover boss because Jesus, the the ultimate boss, the CEO par excellence, the, the king, the 
the judge who is on the throne goes undercover to find out how his followers really treat him. That's just the first of many surprises that we find in this parable, which is also called the parable of the sheep and the goats. So the setting is when the the Son of Man, when Jesus, comes back in all his glory, sits on the throne, and all the nations, all the people gather around the throne, and Jesus, as the judge, starts to to separate this group from the sheep are on his right, the goats are on his left, and we later find out that this is a kind of a judgment on these sheep and goats. And so the sheep are told that they are blessed, that they are invited to inherit the kingdom that has been prepared for them. The goats, on the other hand, are cursed. And they are sent out to go into the eternal fire and punishment. And what is the basis upon which these two groups are separated? Is it what denomination they're a part of? Or whether or not they're conservative or liberal, what kind of right theology they have? Is it, is it how often they attended church or whether or not they upheld the Jewish law at the time? Is it whether or not they're baptized? Is it whether or not they have faith? What, what's the all-important basis upon which this judgment will occur? The sole, single solitary criteria in this parable is for the ones who are invited to inherit the kingdom is whether or not they gave food to someone who was hungry, whether or not they offered a drink to someone who was thirsty, whether or not they gave one of their 10 t-shirts to somebody who had none, whether or not they, they visited people in prison or took care of someone when they were sick, That is the basis upon which this judgment will occur. And that's it. It's plain and simple. No other requirements are needed. There's the second surprise of this parable. The first one is that the king, the judge, has gone undercover to be the least of these. The second surprise is that the only requirement is how we treat those in need. And it's a surprise it's a surprise because the people back in Jesus's day would have protested. They would have said, "Wait, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean, Jesus? What about the law? Surely we have to follow the law, the Jewish law at the time." And we today protest also, right? Wait, 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 Jesus. Surely you have to have faith. Surely faith is is a part of this judgment, isn't it? But the parable itself merely focuses on what we do, how we serve those who we may consider the least of these, just as you did it to the least of these who are members of my family. Now, I know all you theologians out there and biblically and literate people are cringing But Chris, that is works righteousness. We're not saved by our works. We're saved, as the Presbyterians have coined, by grace through faith. And yes, you would be right. But Matthew doesn't know the difference between faith and works. There is no dichotomy. There is no either more. If you were to ask Matthew, okay, so Matthew, primarily speaking, are we saved by what we believe or are we saved by what we do? He would look at you like you had three heads. Well, what do you mean or? How you live is a testimony to what you believe. And what you believe affects how you live. It's two sides of the same coin. You can't separate them. You can't put one over the other. And, of course, we know in James he 
it says, faith without works is dead. It's not really faith unless you've lived it out. So what we do matters. How we live matters. So a man can tell a woman how much he loves her. But when he beats her up every week, that tells you what he really believes. You can't separate the words you say with the actions that you live. And so because of that, we have passages as in 1 John 4.20 that says those who say I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. You literally cannot love God unless you're loving your neighbor. Jesus gave us two great, wonderful commandments that sum up the law. You want to know how to live the law? Here's what you have to do. You have to love God. You have to love your neighbor. But what Jesus did is he linked the two together. You can't have one without the other. You can't love God, but then completely ignore the needs of your neighbor. If you love God, then you will love your neighbor. They go together, hand in hand, two sides of the same coin. Faith and love have to impact the way we live, the decisions that we make, how we spend our money, who we pay attention to. So what does that love look like? It looks like food and water and clothes and hospitality and companionship. The most readily available gift each of us have, we all have that in one form or another. We have food, we have water, we have clothes, we have the ability to provide hospitality and companionship. Jesus isn't saying you have to go sell everything and move to India or Africa and serve the poorest of poor. No, what he's saying is take the blessings that you already have and go out and share some of it with those who are in need. Go out and share some of it with me, says Jesus. And you would, wouldn't you? I mean, literally, if Jesus knocked on your door this afternoon and, like, I don't know, showed you his business card to prove it was Jesus, you'd let him in, right? Oh, my gosh, Jesus, what an honor. How amazing it is. You come to visit me. Please come on in. You know, have a seat. Take your shoes off. Can I get you something to drink? Would you stay here for dinner? Um, You know, we have the guest room. Spend the night. I mean, wouldn't we fall all over ourselves if we truly believed Jesus was, was visiting with us, that he just happened to be in town for the day? I mean, after all, this is our Lord and Savior. This is the one who died for us. We owe him everything. Surely we can cook a, a chicken dinner for him one night and let him sleep in our guest room. If we really believed it was Jesus, we would go to the extreme to provide whatever he needed. If I knew it was you, Bob, I would have treated you differently. Why didn't you why didn't you say it was you? If I had only known, I would have acted differently. Did you catch the fact that both the sheep and the goat were completely surprised? that they had run into Jesus along the way. Neither of them had any idea that they were serving Jesus. They were just going about their normal, everyday life. They weren't thinking, oh, maybe this is Jesus. I better be nice to them just in case. They were just living out their faith, what they believed, how they felt they should live. And along the way, ran into Jesus incognito. You won't see Jesus, or at least you won't recognize him. He comes to us in the people that we least expect. But 
we do have an opportunity to minister to him, to serve him as we are open to those who are in need. It's another one of the great paradoxes of the Christian faith. The king on the throne comes to us in the ones we least expect. Jesus, when did we see you? And Jesus responds, you saw me every day. I'm all around you. Didn't you know that? Do you understand the radical implications that has? What it means is that when we leave here, when we go do what we might call mission work, we're not taking Jesus to people and giving Jesus to them. Jesus is already out there. Mission is all about leaving here and finding Jesus already at work in the world. This community is sent out as the body of Christ to encounter Christ's body in the world. Our mission becomes redefined because as we move out into the community, we're moving toward where God already is. Jesus isn't just coming back one day so we all just need to kind of sit around until he gets here. Jesus is already here, right here and right now. And this parable builds on the ones that are before it, because right before this parable, there are actually three other what they call judgment parables. And this kind of puts flesh on it, helps us understand those other three. What does it look like to wait until Jesus comes back? Here's what it looks like. This is what it looks like to to have extra oil for your lamp while you're waiting for the bridegroom. This, This is what it looks like when you're investing your talents before the master returns to hold you accountable. This is what it looks like. To stay awake until the master arrives at some unexpected time. This is what we need to be doing as we're waiting for that judgment or for that second coming when that son of man comes once again. We see Jesus in the stranger. We see Jesus in the prisoner. We see Jesus in the child who is hungry. We see Jesus all around us. Jesus isn't just coming back one day. He's already here. Incognito. Undercover. Wondering how we will respond. And it's not an exhaustive list. This giving food to the hungry, drink to the thirsty, clothes to to those who have little visiting those who are in prison or caring for those who are sick. It's not meant to be an exhaustive list. It's not like we can say, well, you know, Jesus didn't say anything about racial injustice, so I don't have to worry about dealing with, you know, prejudice in this country. It's not like Jesus, we can say, well, Jesus didn't, um, you know, talk about discrimination or violence against the LGBTQ community, so I don't have to get involved with with that issue or with those people. Who are the least of these? And how do we show love? How do we serve those experiencing hardship, those who are suffering in our community and beyond? How are we doing to promote racial reconciliation? What are we doing to care for those who are being discriminated against? And how can we specifically care for all people who are in need? As Christians, we don't have the luxury of just ignoring those who make us feel uncomfortable. 
We don't have the luxury of just turning off the TV when we see pictures we don't like or blaming victim after victim over and over again. We can't keep going back to business as usual when there are people in this country who are at a disadvantage because there are lack of opportunities for, for employment, for education, for, for be, maybe because they have mental illnesses, whatever the case is. There are people who are hurting right here in our neighborhoods, right here in Virginia Beach. Because sin is not just doing something that's wrong. It's a failure to do what is right. And whenever we don't offer food to someone who's hungry or a drink to someone who's thirsty, whenever we fail to care for and meet the needs of others, we're not living the way God is asking us to do. And we're not serving Jesus who is in our midst. This judgment parable is a wake-up call because we can too easily be lulled into an apathetic way of life that says, well, hey, me and my own are taken care of, and that's all that really matters. No, says this parable, that's not all that matters. What matters is helping those in need, caring, loving, serving, blessing, in some way, shape, or form, because that's where Jesus is. Incognito, right there in our midst. Another judgment parable from Luke ends with a phrase you may have heard before, from everyone to whom much has been given, much is required. And from one to whom much has been entrusted, even more will be demanded. If you want to take a look at this entire world, there's no denying that we have been entrusted with much. If you take a look at at who we are in this church, we have been given much. Therefore, much is required. Much is demanded. How can we better live out our sheep calling to go and serve Jesus in this world and find him in those that we may consider to be the least among us? When was the last time you personally alleviated someone else's suffering? who was not a family member or a friend. The judgment parables aren't meant to create fear. They're meant to instill a way of living in love and service to our our neighbor, to inspire that kind of life. We've got to show care through our actions because the one who will judge us is the one who is waiting for us to show compassion. Mother Teresa said it best. Because at the end of our lives, we will not be judged by how many diplomas we have received, how much money we have made, or how many great things we have done. We will be judged by, I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was homeless, and you took me in. Jesus, when did we see you hungry? Jesus responds, you didn't. 